Hi everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Eleanor and I'm, I'd like to welcome you to Big Questions this week. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, Big Questions is an opportunity to think through really carefully, um, like the title suggests, some of life's big questions um, about meaning and purpose and the Christian faith. Um, and this week we're looking at the concept of the good life, um, what that means and where we can find it. And Bobby Jameson is here um, to help us think through this question a bit. He's going to give us um, a short talk, then there'll be time for some discussion around tables, um, and then there'll be a question and answer time afterwards. Bobby um, is studying for his PhD um, here in the, in the Divinity Faculty, um, and he's also an affiliated lecturer um, in New Testament Greek. So please do um, be texting in your questions as the talk goes on for the question and answer time afterwards. The number that you need for that will be on the screen um, behind me and on the pillars around the room as well. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Bobby up. Thanks very much for coming and thanks very much for having me. The question I was given to answer is the good life, does it get any better than Cambridge? That's a fair question. Cambridge is an intoxicating place, isn't it? I'm not quite two years through a PhD, and I think my buzz still hasn't quite worn off. Although maybe that's because I don't have exams every spring. The buildings, the gardens, the river, the robes, formal halls, the prestige and promise, the future wide open before you, that feeling of being in a place that's not really like any other place on earth. We all know that Oxford doesn't even come close. I love Cambridge. It's easily my favorite city I've ever lived in. It's easily one of my favorite places I've ever been to. And I'm dreading the day that's coming all too soon when I have to kiss this place goodbye. And yet, there's a temptation, and I use that word very deliberately. There's a temptation for all of us who study here. And that is to say, this is as good as it gets. This place can and will give me everything I want out of life, whether now through the experience I'm having or through the doors this is going to open up for my future. The temptation is to treat what Cambridge has to offer as if it can fully and finally satisfy you. In the few minutes we have together, I want to try to do two things. First, I want to suggest four reasons why Cambridge can't be as good as it gets. As wonderful as this place is, it can never give you all you want. And secondly, I want to tell a story Jesus told that shows you someone who can give you all you want. First then, let's think together about four reasons why Cambridge isn't as good as it gets, why Cambridge can't finally give you all you want. Reason number one, which I'm sure will be familiar to just about all of us, pressure. How much is riding on the exams you're about to take over the next couple weeks? Or if not this year, then next year or the year after? Whose expectations are weighing on you? Parents, relatives, former teachers, current supervisors? What happens if you don't do as well as you and they hope? Or what kind of pressure do you put on yourself? Or do your friends put any kind of pressure on you? Maybe you have friends who are after the good old a first, a blue, and a spouse routine. Maybe they're coming along well in that area, but what do you have to show for yourself? I wonder if your Cambridge experience has followed anything like the following trajectory. When you get accepted, you're thrilled. When you show up, you're sort of giddy with anticipation. First couple of terms, you have great fun. You make friends, you row for your college, you squeeze in you know, some essays and supervisions as you have time around the margins. But then Easter term rolls around, and exams take over. And you begin to have thoughts like, why on earth did I even come here? Why would anyone ever come here? Why in the 21st century do we still have such barbaric practices as exams? Maybe some of you have been similarly disillusioned. Maybe some of you <laughs> are facing this for the first time. But in any case, most of us here studying in Cambridge face considerable pressure. So how do you handle the pressure? Do you ever try to sort of relieve the pressure in ways that, in retrospect, might appear foolish or even damaging to yourself or to other people? A second reason why Cambridge can't be as good as it gets, performance. This one's a close cousin of pressure. 
Back in the day, Cambridge was basically a good old boys club. But now, it's much more of a meritocracy. You want to get here, you better perform. You want to succeed here, you better perform. And if you were the standout person in your school, maybe you got the best marks in sixth form, the best scores in A levels, well, now that's pretty much true of everybody around you. It's a whole new league. And here's the thing about a performance-based culture. It tends to lead you to develop a performance-based identity. There's a subtle message in places like Cambridge that you are only as good as your worst exam score. You're only as good as your worst mark on that essay. If you constantly have to prove yourself by how you do, then it's very easy for your entire worth as an individual to get tied up in how you perform. And this tends to have one of two outcomes. If you succeed, it's very difficult not to become insufferable. If you've succeeded and you've made it because of what you've done, then you're the best and you shouldn't really have time of day for anybody else. Why bother? But on the other hand, if you fail, it's very difficult not to despair, not to be humiliated, not to be, frankly, crushed. In a place where performance counts for so much, any kind of failure can be personally devastating. Reason number three, privilege. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against privilege. I enjoy plenty of it myself. And yet, privilege is just a gift. The test is what you do with it, how you use it, what you make of it. But if a place as astonishingly privileged as Cambridge is your vision for the good life, then what does that say to people who will never even have a shot at a life like this? People for whom this is just so far outside the realm of possibility. They couldn't even contemplate a life like this. If Cambridge is your vision of the good life, then what does your good life have to say to them? So pressure, performance, privilege, a fourth reason why Cambridge can't be as good as it gets. It ends. And rather quickly. I did a little bit of math, that, uh, aided by a few undergraduate friends of mine. As an undergrad, if you live here just during term time, you'll spend around 90 weeks in Cambridge. 600 or so days. Blink and it's over. Anybody here ever read the book H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald? Anyone? 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 No? Oh, it's a great book. Little depressing, but a wonderful book. You probably don't want to read it in the middle of exam season, but maybe after when it's bright and sunny in summer and you're relaxing. Anyways, Helen MacDonald was a research fellow at Jesus College. Her father died unexpectedly, and she trained a hawk to cope with the grief. It's a long story. It makes sense in the book. Um, but at the time she was writing about, her fellowship at Jesus was just about to end, like, like this kind of the last few months of her time at Jesus, and she doesn't know what's going to happen after. She's got this college job. It's ending. She has no idea what comes next. So I'm going to read a bit of a long quote where she reflects on this, her time at Cambridge coming to an end. It's a long quote, but it's worth kind of soaking in and steeping in. MacDonald writes, In two months, my college job will end. In two months, I'll have no office, no college, no salary, no home. Everything will be different. But I think everything already is. When Alice dropped down the rabbit hole into Wonderland, she fell so slowly, she could take things from the cupboards and bookshelves on the walls, look curiously at the maps and pictures that passed her by. In my three years as a fellow here, there had been lectures and libraries and college meetings, supervisions, admissions interviews, late nights of paper writing and essay marking, and other things soaked in Cantabrigian glamour. Eating pheasant by candlelight at high table while snow dashed itself in flurries against the leaded glass, and carols were sung, and the port was passed, and the silver glittered upon dark polished refectory tables. Now, I knew I had always been falling as I moved past these things. I could reach out and touch them, but they were not mine. Not really ever mine. Alice, falling, looked down to see where she was headed. But everything below her was darkness. Maybe unlike Alice in Wonderland, you're falling towards some light. Another degree, a job, a promising relationship. But like Alice, you are falling. Cambridge is passing you by. And very soon it will be out of reach. 
So those are a few reasons why, as much as I love this place and my love for it remains undiminished, as much as I love this place, Cambridge can't give you all you want. The vision of the good life, of academic success, of a promising career, of connections, of whatever it is you want to make out of life. The vision that this place holds out to you in the experience now and in the future it promises. It can't be everything. It can't give you everything. If you try to find everything in it, you will eventually only be disappointed. But my second point, there is someone who can give you all you want. Someone who can fully and finally satisfy you. Jesus once told a very short story about the good life. If you're curious, it's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Here's what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The story is so short, I'll read it again. I mean, might as well. It's only one sentence. Just in case you didn't hear it the first time. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, if you're thinking this guy made a slightly shady move in buying the field without telling the owner that there's this treasure lying in it, first of all, that's not really the point of the parable. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, he did buy the field to sort of lay a legitimate claim to what was in it. He bought it fair and square. He didn't just take the treasure away and make off with it. In any case, to get into any more sort of detail on that would take us back to ancient customs surrounding property law and things buried in fields, and we don't really need to go there. So just take my word for it. It's not the point of the parable. But the point of the story is that this scenario, this unexpected discovery, this finding treasure, this joyfully giving up everything to get it, is what Jesus' kingdom is like. It's like stumbling across something so valuable that you'll gladly part with anything to get it. It's like unexpectedly finding something so thrilling and so satisfying that everything else pales in comparison and you'll gladly say no to whatever might possibly get in its way. What is this kingdom of heaven Jesus is talking about? It's a nice Christian-y sounding phrase. What does it actually mean? The kingdom of heaven, as Jesus preaches in the Gospels, is his own reign over all things as Savior and Lord. Jesus came to earth to restore God's rule over people and over all creation. The kingdom of heaven is the right relationship with God and the right and rewarding life that follows, that only Jesus can bring. The Bible teaches that God created everything out of sheer overflowing goodness and grace. At the beginning of everything is God's yes. Creation is good. And he created people good. But from the very beginning, all of us have rejected God's right to rule us, and we've tried to rule ourselves. We've acted as if we can do a better job running the universe and running our lives than God can. We've acted as if only by saying no to what God wants for us can we actually find fulfillment and satisfaction. But that's a dead end, and in more ways than one. It's a dead end because God made us to find satisfaction in Him. And as long as we seek ultimate satisfaction anywhere else, we will come up empty. We will never find what we're looking for. But trying to find satisfaction without God is also a dead end in that it quite literally leads to death. Because God is good, if we oppose him, he will oppose us. God has set the date for all of our final exams. And the last judgment is a test that none of us can pass. But Jesus came to earth precisely in order to succeed where we'd failed and to restore us to fellowship with God and to enable us to be satisfied in God. Jesus died on the cross to bear the punishment for all that we've ever done wrong, all the ways we've ever failed, and to make it possible for us through nothing good that we've done to be accepted by God. And Jesus rose from the dead in order to defeat death and remake a, cre a new creation in which God's people will find perfect satisfaction in him. Jesus gave everything for those who deserve nothing. And he gave everything so that we could find everything in him and that we would receive everything with him. The point of Jesus' story that he's telling here is that the truly good life is found only in him. 
It's found only through trusting in him, only through giving yourself up to him. Only casting yourself on him is the only way that you can be right with God and the only way that you can live the life that God would truly have you live. Jesus offers the kind of joy that makes it a no-brainer to say no to everything else that would oppose and contradict what he calls you to do. You might think Christianity is all about saying no. No sex, no drinking, no parties, no fun, no whatever. But Jesus only ever calls us to say no to something in order to say yes to something better, to say yes to satisfaction that will actually last. The Bible says that there's a yes at the beginning of everything in creation. There's a yes at the bottom of everything in God's purposes for us. And there's a yes at the end of everything. For those who trust in Jesus, there's God's affirmation of everything good he's ever made. He will give to his people to satisfy them. No is never the final word for a Christian. Certainly the Christian life means saying no to all sorts of things now. But it's only saying no in order to obtain a better satisfaction, a satisfaction that will last. To back this claim up, I want to briefly consider how the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection handles the four points about Cambridge I mentioned a moment ago. The four points about why the good life of Cambridge can't finally satisfy you. Pressure, performance, uh, what's my third one? Privilege. And does it end? First, pressure. Jesus knows about pressure. Here's what he says in Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus doesn't put more pressure on you. He takes it off and bears it himself, so you can find rest in him. Performance. You can't perform your way into God's grace. You can't perform your way into a right relationship with God. Thinking that way is actually the opposite of Christianity. The message of Christianity is that there is nothing you can do to set your situation right with God and that Jesus has done everything for you so that all you need to do is accept him and accept what he's done. That is the absolute opposite of a performance-based culture, and it leads to the absolute opposite of a performance-based identity. If Jesus has done everything for you and given everything to you that you could never do for yourself, you've received this relationship with God as a gift. You've received a new identity as one of his people as a gift. There's nothing you've done to earn it, and there's nothing you can do to mess it up. If you trust in Jesus, your identity is no longer fundamentally based on how you perform. If you fail, Jesus has already taken care of your failures on the cross. And if you trust in Christ, there's nothing you can do that will make God turn away from you or reject you. And if you succeed at whatever you do, if you succeed academically, professionally, you have every reason to be humble and thankful, not to become arrogant and insufferable, because everything you have is a gift from God. Everything, your abilities, opportunities, the financial provision you have, the skills that got you where you are, everything you have is a gift. So the more you succeed, the more reasons you have to be thankful and humble. Third, privilege. Through Jesus, God makes undeserving people his sons and daughters, and he makes them heirs in the most literal possible sense of the whole world. Trusting in Jesus gives you a kind of privilege and a kind of status that far outranks anything Cambridge can give you. And instead of a kind of exclusive identity that makes it very easy to look down on people who don't measure up, a kind of identity that makes it easier to think in subtle ways that you're sort of superior to others, this privilege has come through nothing you've done, And it extends to all people, regardless of class, regardless of moral performance, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of any kind of prerequisite. The privilege of being God's sons and daughters through Jesus is free to all. And so it's the kind of privilege that makes you more welcoming, more hospitable, more eager to embrace people who are completely different from you and who you might have been tempted otherwise to look down on. Pressure, performance, privilege, finally, does it end? Unlike the good life Cambridge offers you, the good life with Jesus doesn't end. Let's say you engineer the perfect post-Cambridge existence. Whether this is your only degree or there are others coming, let's say you get the perfect job, perfect house, perfect perks, perfect spouse, perfect family, on down the line. Everything goes according to your neatly scripted plan. Cambridge lasts only 90 weeks. How long does your perfect life last? Assuming you get this perfect life you're striving after. 60 years from now, 70. The older you get, the faster it goes. 
And the longer you live, the more you might find that the thing you get isn't the thing you were chasing. It sounds like a cliche, but I'm staking my life on this and you should too. Only Jesus offers a kind of satisfaction that will never expire, will never go bad, will never let you down. It doesn't depend on how you perform. It doesn't depend on circumstances. It doesn't depend on the kind of things you do. Only Jesus offers a good life that offers lasting and unassailable happiness and joy. Only Jesus gave up everything so that you could have him and everything in him. I think the real telling phrase in Jesus' parable, this one-sentence story we've been thinking about, I think the real telling phrase is this. In his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. So here's a question I want to leave you with and that we're going to spend a few minutes kind of in our tables thinking through together question I hope you'll find useful for discussion. What could be worth joyfully giving up everything to get? Thanks for your time. Hope you have a useful discussion, and then we'll come back for some Q&A. Okay, um, thanks. Let's draw back together now. Um, so we've had some questions texted in, um, but there's also going to be a roving mic going round. Um, so first of all, are there any questions from the floor? Um, if you have a question, just stick your hand up. No? Okay, great. We're we'll going for one. Text it in. Uh, so the first question, um, why does the good life have to be Jesus? Can't it be found elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the way I'd want to answer that is to say, let's start with the problem. And ultimately, our problem is death. Death ends everything. Uh, however good your life is, good stuff will be taken out of it all the time by death. Family members dying, loved ones dying, physical illness that's leading toward death. And, you know, however, however much time it seems like you have sort of stretching in front of you, it's not going to be much in the end. That's a sort of universal testimony of people as they get older. As you get older, it goes faster. As you get older, it goes faster. Um, so in a sense, I, if we start with the problem of death, well, how do you actually have a solution to death? How do you actually have an answer to death? That's not just a kind of coping mechanism. You know, there's no cure, there's no pill, there's no surgery. But Jesus got up from the dead. He died, passed through death, died on our behalf, and got up. Flesh and blood came out the other side. And I would say there's nothing else besides Jesus' resurrection that actually gives us an answer to death. Any other answer is not finally going to give you a life that lasts. It's not finally going to deal with our sort of biggest, worst problem. That's the kind of arch problem over everything else. So on one level, sure, there are all sorts of things that can give you a better life. All sorts of things that can give you a better life. And that's worth talking about and cooperating toward and thinking about how we can work toward the common good in all sorts of ways. But as an ultimate answer, I only see one ultimate answer, which is Jesus' resurrection. So in a sense, the solution fits the problem. Um, yeah, that's how I would, that's a, a brief take on that one. Great, thanks. Does anyone want to come back on that? Yeah. Uh, if you just wait for the mic to come to you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of, um, the, I thought the solution to kind of death is um, Jesus' resurrection. How do you sort of be able to, how would that help someone who isn't um, Jesus, as it were? Because, like, if you say that that's kind of an inspirational example of someone kind of rising from the dead, but to most of the rest of us, death still seems quite final, and it's not quite sure how kind of a faith in Jesus, as opposed to faith in any, any other religion or anything else, other kind of supernatural or whatever, would help, or maybe none of them would help, or how do you know that's kind of the problem? Yeah, well, the basic claim of Christianity is that what Jesus did in his death and resurrection, he did for all those who would trust in him. If you trust in him, you're united to him. If you're united to him, you share his fate. His death is your death, his resurrection is your resurrection, and guarantees yours. So I suppose by saying his resurrection is the solution to death, I'm also saying I would invite you and urge you to trust in him as the only way to get into that solution. So you're absolutely right. It's cold comfort if you sort of don't have anything to do with Jesus. Um, but in a sense, that's the whole point. That's the whole invitation. That's the whole call is to believe in him so that what is true of him becomes true for you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah. 
Hi. Um, what if death is not a problem for me? Like, what if I'm the kind of person who um, acknowledges that life is going to end, but there are loads of other meaningful things and ways that I can enjoy my life? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on one level, that is certainly a way that a lot of people sort of cope, uh, cope with death. Um, and, I mean, in a way, I'm not sure I'd have an easy answer. I suppose I'd want to talk to you about what happens when someone you love dies or what happens when your own death might be approaching or what happens when something happens in your life that's not as easily coped with, um, that's not as easily just kind of absorbed into your sort of version of the good life. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I could give you a kind of really satisfying answer in the spot. I might just want to say, I'd want to see how that would play out over time. Um, I'd want to see what that looks like in video, not just the picture. Thanks. Um, I think there was another question in the middle. Um, let's go for another texted in one then. Um, isn't it just more ris realistic to accept that we can never get the good life? Yeah, very British solution. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in sort of ancient philosophical terms, a very stoic solution um, that says, you know, our problem in life is that we're too attached to it. We, our emotions kind of get the better of us. And we need to sort of damp down our emotional attachment to life so that it actually matches the sort of crazy things Fortuna throws our way. Um, I think on one level, that is a tidy philosophical solution. Our problem is we're sort of, you know, okay, your expectation's too high, damp down your expectations. Well, as a pragmatic sort of bit-by-bit -bit solution, that can be helpful for certain circumstances. But as an overall life philosophy, I think, a I think it's very difficult to actually live out consistently in practice. So there's some saying, I forget which of the major Stokes it was. Um, maybe Seneca, maybe Epictetus. One of those said, when you kiss your son, sort of in the morning, remember he might be dead tomorrow and don't get too attached. <laughs> you know? I mean, so, th that, and that was, that's a sort of, you know, stoicism in action, which, which correlates to this sort of, you know, don't get too attached, right? Like, we can never really get the good life, don't get too worked up about it. At the end of the day, it winds up just kind of feeling inhuman. The more consistently you try to do that, the more there's just something in us that pushes back against that. Like, what a horrible thing to be thinking is you, you know, I kissed my kids goodbye before I cycled off to the library this morning. That's a, that's a weird thing to be thinking about um, every day. And, and so I suppose there's, there's quite a lot there of philosophical substance, whether in the basic British version of just not having to have expectations or in the more philosophical stoic version. But I think it's hard to do in practice. And if it's hard to do in practice, what does that say about the sort of way we're wired as human beings? What does that say about there's something sort of resilient in us that resists being damped down as a kind of final solution? Great, then I want to come back on that or ask another question. Okay, great, we'll go for another one from the text. Um, so if Christians become equal as God's heirs, how is it that there is so much privilege in contrast to so much suffering in this life? Hmm. Meaning that even Christians experience suffering, or just that the sort of problem of suffering in general? Do we know? Um, sure. If the person who texted in wants to stick a hand up, otherwise... Um, That's okay. You. If not, um, let me think about that for a second. I suppose... Um, I'll try to answer the kind of two versions of how that question might go. The first version being... Why would Christians have such a rough lot in this life if you're supposed to kind of share Jesus' fate? Um, and again, the basic answer to that, because isn't throughout the New Testament, is just like Jesus suffered first, then entered into glory, that becomes the shape of the Christian life. So Christians should actually expect suffering. Um, not everything changed at once. Our bodies still decay. We still face death. So to questions about death as an enemy, Paul says it's the last enemy. It's the last enemy to be defeated, and it will be defeated, but it hasn't been defeated yet. And so if we're talking about Christian suffering, there's very much a suffering then glory pattern to the Christian life. So when I say Christians live the good life, I don't mean, you know, the sort of prosperity message that's popular in America and around the world that says, you know, you get this perfect life, everything gets better, you get rich, you get healthy, you get happy. I'm not saying that about becoming a Christian. I mean you have the kind of satisfaction and joy and contentment that can flourish despite the worst outward circumstances. So for one, it absolutely changes how you handle suffering and adversity now. And there is an absolute promise that things will change in the end. So it's not that I'm saying everything gets sort of hunky-dory for Christians now. Suffering is expected. It's what Jesus did. We follow a guy who got crucified, so we don't expect 
everything to work out perfectly in our lives now. Um, so it comes later, and there is, a, there is a, a sense of waiting in that shape of the Christian life. As far as, ooh, if there's a sense of, does this make, am I saying Christians are sort of privileged over against everybody else, and it's sort of like everything's great for Christians, but, you know, who cares what happens to anybody else? Um, I could point to the church's um, generally pretty remarkable record of extending care to people in suffering. So even just one ancient example, when there's all sorts of plagues in the early Roman Empire in the first couple centuries, even the most renowned medical doctors fled because they didn't want to die. What good is it being a doctor if you're just going to die? You can't help people if you're dead. But plenty of Christians stayed around and cared for, cared for people, got sick themselves. And it was a huge kind of splash of, of, a, of a public sort of presence of Christianity in the Roman Empire. That's one ancient example. You could multiply modern ones. So Christians aren't characteristically unconcerned with other people's suffering. Um, yeah, to do more than that would kind of get a bit, bit far afield. But I would say I, the, being a Christian does not in any way mean everything's great for me. I don't care about everybody else. It means there should be a whole pattern. Just like Jesus gave up everything to save others, that pattern should characterize Christians too, that we're, we're perfectly willing to give up comfort and privilege and wealth and all sorts of other things to extend whatever blessing we can to other people. That's at least the kind of life we should be living. Brilliant. Thanks, Bobby. That's yeah. really great. Um